Oh my gosh. There's another nasty yuck winter night here in the waning days of 2022. Yes, little dog. We are in the collapse of global industrial civilization. It is now a Thursday night. That would be December 8th, 2022, where we just had the earliest sunset of the year. This is the earliest sunset of my entire life since the day I was born 63 years ago. 4.33 the sun went down this afternoon. Good Lord, and uh, people who don't believe me, December 21st is not the earliest sunset of the year. Uh, Anywho, but uh, since some of you might have figured out, I, I have even more time than I uh, thought I had due to the uh, these early sunsets. So what I've decided to do is pretty much do two chronicles of the collapse from good old medium.com. I guess for <coughs> until I move on with my life, I, I am just a, you know, a little doomer kid in the candy store over here at medium.com. And uh, I, I, I could do every day for the next year, I could do five chronicles of the collapse without ever leaving medium.com. But you know, guys, I have to admit I've been a little disrespectful to the king of the doomers in medium.com. So, of course, we're talking about Umer Hack, the undisputed uh, king, godfather of doom, whatever you want to... Uh, to say, so we're going to check in with Umer. Now, I'm not going to sit here and read his daily book length uh, rant. I do not know where this man just finds the time to do the typing that he does. The, the Umer hack is the most prolific doomer, uh, as far as I know, in history. I like how Umer, I think he's some sort of economist, under his, you know, describing what he is, he has reduced it to one word, Umer Hack calls himself a vampire. So, <laughs> so maybe he does this, all of this dooming uh, during the night. I am proud to see that Umer, Umer the Doomer, uh, the vampire Doomer, has 186,000 followers. I don't know if we will ever get Umer on the show. So what we're going to do, what I'm going to do is read the opening and the closing uh, of his newest, I think this is his newest rant, although it's dated December 5th. It, it, good Lord, he could have had three more. But classic Umer. <clears throat> the beginning of the end of the world. Why we have to take the idea of civilizational collapse seriously and what it really looks like. It, it, you know, this is one of the major themes uh, here at medium.com is all of the doomers talking about what does this look like so we're going to open this story and then close it. Okay, take away, Umer. Here's a tiny question. In your darker moments, do you wonder if, well, in some elemental sense, the world around us is ending? That things have changed. Doesn't something deep down in your gut whisper that? changed. Whisper that to you? Mine does. <coughs> Hold on. Am I serious? How am I not? A relatively mild pandemic brought our civilization to its knees. Hmm. The world is already resorting to resource wars in anticipation of climate change. 
and we and we are our climate. Huh. Now that doesn't make any sense. Anyway, uh, we we have a grammatical mistake, and and we are our climate in action. I don't know what the word we are. Anyway, and our climate in action is causing levels of warming faster and worse than scientists predicted. And he links, uh, you know, all through his rants, he links you to all of these, uh, like that latest charge he just made. So let's talk about what I mean by the world ending. <clears throat> what does that strange phrase really mean? We have to step far, far outside ourselves to really understand it because I don't mean a meteor, I don't even mean runaway climate change causing catastrophe after catastrophe. It means just more of, of, of this now, what we're already living in, a kind of bizarre, gruesome, hellish dystopia. The end of the world feels like now for a very good reason. A species, that's us, fighting each other desperately for life on a dying planet. And then he does, you know, it's a little bit overused, but uh, he goes into the old Doomer uh, fallback. Imagine that aliens visited this planet. What would they see? Well, they would see something like this. And then he, uh, so anyway, guys, he goes on and on and on. Uh, I'm going to skip over because I want to get to another uh, chronicle from a fellow named Mike Myers. Uh, I'm just going to skip uh, good Lord, we're going to go flying down. Uh, he talks a lot about Chicken Little and the sky falling. Uh, okay. All right. We're going to pick up right here. We're about two-thirds of the three, of three-fourths of the way to it. So, You'll have to go on medium.com and uh, and and fill in the blanks. I will put the uh, the link on here. But he kind of sums it all up towards the end. But we're gonna break in right here. What happens when Calcutta and Bangkok and Karachi are too hot to live in? Almost 50 million people live in those cities alone. That is more than 10 times the number of Syrian refugees who destabilize the West. What happens when all those people began fleeing their burning cities? What happens when 10 million climate refugees make their ways through the Middle East to Europe's doorstep? When the Amazon has been slashed and burned, making swaths of Central and South America largely unlivable, desolate wastes, and tens of millions arrive at America's doorstep. Well, what's likely to happen is another wave of fascism. Do you see how China, just like that, snap, put a million people in camps. That is what's likely to happen in America and Europe too, as climate change and mass extinction cause massive flows of human beings fleeing from their cities on fire and their towns in flames. But it's not just climate change that's going to wreck the stable, the stable simple world we're used to. Poor people over there, please. Rich people over here, and rarely 
do the two ever meet? Water sources are running dry globally already. What happens, uh, what happens when Delhi and Karachi and Calcutta run out of water? Have you ever wondered? Well, one simple answer probably is war, likely nuclear war. And long before that happens, seeing it, seeing it coming, those people are going to flee. So resource wars are yet another massive pressure that is going to disrupt the stable, safe, simple world we're used to and consider that Russia has already started one. That world is ending, my friends. It genuinely is the end of the world in a profoundly and lethally real way. Not the world as in the only one, but a world which is the only one we have ever known. So he finally gets to, uh, and then he uh, kind of backs up. Now, that was far too long. I agree, Umer, uh, that was far too long. So let me try to crystallize my point. Okay, so this is where uh, Umer Hack sums it all up for the first uh, 10,000 words. <clears throat> the world that we are inheriting is going to be a very different place than the one we are used to. It's not going to be one of three strata that barely ever that barely ever touch anymore. The ultra rich, example, the creepy Twitter billionaire, the merely rich, the average American, and the poor, everyone else on the globe. It is going to be a world where instead these three strata collide in explosive, dramatic, fatal ways, finding themselves at each other's throats. That new dystopian world is going to be marked by three implosive changes. <clears throat> The stratum of merely rich, I guess, according to Umer, I am Sam Mitchell living in his 49 square foot tiny house, is merely rich. The stratum of merely rich is going to become increasingly poor. Why? Because we're living on a dying planet. There isn't going to be enough to go around. There already isn't. Climate change wildfires destroyed Europe's crops. Increasingly, the merely rich part of the world, the comfortably rich 10%, is going to be less and less insulated from the shock waves of climate change and fascism. The stratum of the poor, at the same time, is going to start to be annihilated by climate change and mass extinction, not to mention being in the middle of implosive capitalism and its enemies. No, not like a Hollywood movie, not all at once, here and there in terrible waves of suffering. There's Delhi running out of water. There's Mumbai and Bangkok and Kuala Lumpur, which become too hot to inhabit. Bang, as the stratum of poor faces annihilation, it's going to flee desperately to the rich west and north through the corridors of the East and South. But the West and North, remember, 
are already going to be getting poorer. How do you think they are likely to react to pulsing, pounding waves of migrants? Not in a friendly way. They are likely to react with defensiveness, <coughs> violence, and rage. Hence, the bottom two strata are about to collide in an epic way. The 90% of global poor and the 10% of global rich as living on a dying planet becomes more and more challenging every day now and self-preservation takes hold over all else. So what about the top stratum, the 0.1%, the global super rich who became the ultra rich, the mere hundred millionaires who became billionaire billionaires. Well, my friends, the ugly truth is that they are likely to laugh as the poor and the formerly rich find themselves pitted against one another. They are going to become something very much like a new global aristocracy, or perhaps I should use the word cacistocracy. Rule of the worst, since they are mostly tacky, cheesy criminals of various kinds, and yet they will prevail for the simple reason that while the first two strata fight each other desperately for basic resources, air, water, food, energy, jobs, they, you know, meaning the top 0.1%, will profit immensely and grow even richer. They will be something like new kings and lords and barons able to buy entire regions and counties and states whole. You know, can you say uh, Bill Gates being the single biggest owner of U.S. farmland uh, in America now? Bill Gates owns more prime farmland than any, uh, than any human uh, in this country. There's this fellow that no one outside of Texas has ever uh, heard of. He's this multi-billionaire. His name is T. Boone Pickens. T. Boone Pickens. I mean, he's right out of a Netflix uh, comedy. And he's an oil man, but what uh, T. Boone Pickens has been doing, good Lord, for going on 20 years, what he is doing is going up and down every river, every irrigated river in the state of Texas and buying up the water rights out of all the rivers that irrigate all of the farmland in Texas. Without that water, no crops are being grown. Um, just a couple uh, of examples in, in, uh, of what he's talking about here. Now, all that's a profoundly, truly ugly vision, and yet I can't help but see all of that happening almost inevitably, unless, and then of course even Umer has to drag out the, uh, the ridiculous Hollywood ending, ending hopium. He, I mean, you didn't even hear three-fourths of this article. We are completely doomed. And uh, then he wraps it up uh, with these last two paragraphs. You and I fight for the future unless you and I fight for the future of this thing we call civilization. Well, apparently the difference between Umer Hack and I and plenty of people I know is still to this day Umer Hack 
the single biggest doomer on uh, medium.com still believes that global industrial civilization is a good thing and that has a worth saving. I happen to disagree with Umer. I, I'm with Steve Bannon. We need to burn it all down. But, but Umer is still, and who am I to go up against Umer Hack? Uh, unless you and I fight for the future of the thing we call civilization, the truth is it has never been good enough, never fully worthy of the name, and it's up to us to make it better. Yes. Uh, and then he... Uh, I, I mean, it, this it, it hurts me to be reading this uh, apocalyptic crap uh, at the end uh, in the end of this essay. The sanest belief, a thought, the, the sanest belief a thoughtful person can hold these days is that the world, all of it, must become transformatively fairer, freer, and wiser if the difficult exercise of human civilization is to endure. The only way to fight the 0-1% laughing and ruling and becoming something very much like neo-feudal overlords as the 90% grimly, desperately battle the 10% for air, water, food, energy, jobs, shelter, and subsistence is for the 90% and the 10% to come together. Yes. Uh, I guess some of you know uh, the name of my farm uh, is Bugs in a Jar Farm. Bugs, and this is exactly what Bugs in a Jar Farm is talking about. It is the biggest psyops uh, in the history of humanity. It, it is the 0.1%. The guys shaking the jar. We are the bugs that these guys are, are, are putting us all in these jars, uh, throwing us all together, shaking up the jar w w with all of this uh, invented, uh, all of these d ridiculous, pointless debates, getting us fighting uh, with each other. Good Lord, pick your poison. Uh, starting all of these fights, and they laugh all the way to the bank. This is why the, you know, these guys, the, the uh, guys he's talking about, uh, made more money uh, since uh, during the corona panic than they've ever made in their lives. They got this whole planet fighting over whether to wear a mask or not. Uh, you know, as they laughed all the way to the bank, it's bugs in a jar that he's talking about. It's been, it's, it's always been the game, always will be the game. We're going to be bugs in a jar uh, and, and tell of the insect apocalypse in a jar. Anyway, back to Umer. Uh, the looted wealth and power of the 0.1% wealth and power they don't deserve in the first place. The 90% and the 10% need to invest all that instead in themselves, each other, the planet, life on it, and don't forget democracy across it. Reread that paragraph because everything you need to know about the future is in it. Yes, really. Sorry if that sounds arrogant, I guess. But the truth is this. If the 90% and the 
known as the bugs in a jar, cannot ally against the 0.1%, you know, the little teenage boy sadist shaking the jar. Uh, then they are both done, and the future is the global mega-rich becoming neo-emperors, imagining stupidly that the ashes of a dead planet and a rocket ship to Mars are worth more than gold. It's time to get radical, my friends! The world is ending! <coughs> Can we build a new one? <laughs> I'm not sure why we would, you know, it ends the same way that thing I was reading yesterday about the Jenga game, uh, picking up the blocks of the Jenga game and uh, anyway, while Umer Hack, uh, he sure as hell gets it, and on one hand, he's not an apocalyptimist. He is still clinging to some belief that us little fighting bugs in a jar, uh, anybody who wants to see what the likelihood of that happening is, you know, get six species of ants, uh, you throw in a couple of wasps and a hornet and, and, and whatnot, put all of these bugs in a jar, shake the jar up, and watch what happens. You are not going to see the bugs in the jar working together to get the lid off the jar. You know... This is why uh, this farm is called Bugs in a Jar Farm. We're a bunch of bugs in a jar killing each other while uh, these bastards laugh all the way to the bank and kill this and destroy this planet. And that is that. But anyway, thank you, Umer. And now we're going to, uh, in part two, we're going to go check in with a, a new writer I've heard who's almost as prolific as uh, Umer Hack, I think, but uh, not many people know him. So we're going to check in with Mike Myers coming up in one minute. Bye, guys.